Hello everyone, welcome to UK Liber TV. In around 2016, as a radicalised and budding young libertarian, I went along to the Libertarian Party conference just to hear what they had to say. 2016, a long time ago, a time where Trump was simply a Republican candidate and an outsider at that, a time where COVID was yet to enter the British public lexicon, and a time where Brexit was hot on everyone's mind. And that was very much the topic of the Libertarian Party conference. I went along there to ask the guest speaker for his comments and thoughts on it. I asked him a question. I told him about my friend who was a Remain supporter at the time. Um, and whilst I was debating with him, I said to him, how could we possibly be spending uh, sending two billion pounds per month when, as a country, we face such stiff economic uh, such a stiff economic crisis? And my friend responded to me, "Well, Ross, we print two billion pounds a month a day. What we send to Europe is hardly anything." I relayed that to the speaker at the Libertarian Conference, and he responded to me with words that were well, as witty as he still is to this day. He said, "Well, my dear boy." That's why I've never hired a degree, hired anyone with a degree in economics. So that speaker was Mr. Godfrey Bloom. He was an MEP for Yorkshire and Humber. He is a author of six books of military history and Austrian economics. Welcome to the show, Mr. Bloom. How are you doing? I'm very well, thank you, and a pleasure to be invited. Um, so, Mr. Bloom, <laughs> I uh, in these days of big tech censorship, um, it's a measure of how much of a threat someone is to the establishment, I feel, if you go onto their Wikipedia page and you look at how many controversies are under their name, and you certainly do have some under your name, rather unfortunately, but that really is to me um, a symbol of what a, um, a threat you are, to be honest. So I just thought we'd just go into a touch, a touch briefly into your kind of um, into your background then. So you graduated from Sandhurst in 1976. Uh, you served as a, log a logistics liaison officer to the 4th Armoured Division in Germany. Um, your father was a pilot during World War II. Uh, did you always have in envision a military career for yourself? Oh, no. Uh, it, I come from a generation, that very few people understand this now, but at my age, I'm 73, 74. Uh, my generation what you did you did a short service commission uh, or something of that nature before you went into the city it was the done thing uh it sounds a bit funny now but uh don't forget all my the middle management in the city were national service officers and all the senior directors were wartime officers so it was felt that if you were going to climb up the greasy pole in the city, it was expected to have some military experience of some description. The other thing you had to do, you had to play rugger, as we call it in those days. <laughs> if you didn't have those two things, there was a glass ceiling. Uh, but it didn't matter to me because I was a key military historian anyway. So you sort of dipped your toe in the military water and buggered off as soon as you could to make get your nose in the trough in the city. And I was that man. OK, excellent. Good. So you had a military career and then you went to work into the city. You worked for Mercury Asset Management. Um, do you think it was here where you first developed a taste for libertarian theory, free market economics? Uh, yes, I suppose it was, because Mercury Asset Management, part of the Warburg Empire in those days, controlled 4% of the London stock market. And at one stage, to cut a very long story short, um, because I have 50, 40 or 50 years experience in the city, um, uh, to cut the long story short, you had to uh, uh, assimilate all sorts of information. You have to have all sorts of information. Uh, and I was given the task when I was uh, head of a fixed interest desk, I was looking at what we called then the single currency in the late uh, 1980s and early 1900s. So I had a very highly technical team with me <clears throat> to look at the implications of a common currency, uh, which of course came later. Uh, and it wasn't long before I drilled down and found out all about that. I realized it was unworkable uh, and it wasn't, uh, it wasn't really going to be in anybody's interests uh, as indeed it's proved to be in nobody's interests at all. So uh, yeah, I then started to look at the concept of Austrian school economics. 
but it didn't come all at once. It was, you know, it was quite slow. You came to it slowly. Uh, and uh, and uh, I'm, I've always been a radical. Uh, I, the Wikipedia people always call me controversial, but of course I'm not, I'm radical. And what is rather amusing, bear in mind that 40% of what Wikipedia says about me is simply not true. But as you know, you can't get anything changed and there's nobody to sue for getting it wrong because they just say uh, they don't have any editorial content, which we all know to be nonsense. So that's really where we are with it. Uh, and I understand the concept of libertarianism. Uh, and one of my books was li on libertarianism. Uh, so yeah, I, I came to it slowly and with a radical perspective. Uh, so, and I'm not uh, evangelical. I've lectured at uh, the Mises Institute, for example, where they are somewhat evangelical, a bit like Bitcoiners are. Uh, you have to sometimes, you have to say, yes, well, I'm broadly speaking, uh, I'm broadly speaking a Christian, for example, but I don't flick through the Bible taking everything I do from morning to night um, from the Bible. I think I live a broadly Christian life, and that's really as good as it gets for a sinner like me. <laughs> yes, I think that's certainly true. Um, I think the uh, libertarians do have a tendency to apply a purity test to some of their uh, views on society, views on politics and views on the world. And sometimes you do have to try to take libertarianism and apply it to what is essentially a statist world that we live in. Um, you decided to join the mad world of politics in 2004. You ran as an MEP and won. Um, did you think you would win when you ran? Good Lord, no. Um, I was fed up with shouting at the TV. I was fed up with shouting, why don't you ask him that question, this politics? Why don't you ask him that? Uh, and of course, the problem with mainstream media, they never ask relevant questions at all. Uh, and even if they did, politicians wouldn't answer them. So I get very angry with the whole thing. And um, uh, I thought I'd have a go under proportional representation up here in Yorkshire, for example, where they rather like people who speak their mind, even if they don't agree with you. They like to call a spade a spade. And I'm uh, quite well known for doing that. Uh, and we had no infrastructure, no nothing in two... 2004, nothing. There was me, a mate from the rugby club, my mother-in-law and my dog, which was a border collie, more intelligent than the rest of us put together. And um, nothing surprised me more when I got elected. Uh, and then of course I got elected again uh, and <clears throat> then I retired, uh, but uh, it, was, it was fairly phenomenal, uh, a success story, not because I'm a clever fellow, which I'm not, it's because I was actually saying what the man in the pub was saying, and I still am. Uh, your man in the pub, your ordinary man on the Clapham omnibus, is unrepresented. He's very, he's full of common sense. He knows what he's talking about. The problem that we have, all the levers of power, of course, are run by the English middle class. And you cannot find a more stupid group of people than the English middle class. And if you don't believe me, Go to Tate Modern and listen to their conversations amongst each other, all right? They are phenomenally stupid and gullible. Uh, we ought to have a government run by cab drivers, uh, chippies, sparkies, uh, barmen. We need real people, but we don't have any real people. There are no real people in politics today. Yeah, I often I like uh, Bill Buckley's uh, the late great American conservatives take on that, where he said, "I would rather be governed by the first two hundred names out of the phone book than by the entire economics faculty at Harvard." And I think what you're saying there really does speak to the truth. Well, your um, speeches in the European Parliament gained a lot of traction in around the 2013, 14, 15 mark. Uh, you spoke um, very passionately about important topics such as. Uh, European politicians, tax avoidance schemes, uh, fractional reserve banking, and the, the uh, faults in all of our economic systems. Now, what was interesting to me about this phenomenon, because many of these speeches went quite viral, um, but they were shared, uh, I noticed, by some quite, what would you say, uh, I guess, leftist in their outlook, um, social media platforms. Uh, Anonymous, for example, uh, shared it, um, and it gained quite a lot of traction through that. This, to me, just is quite an interesting phenomena in that these people, leftists, they don't quite know how to, they know that there is a problem, 
uh, but they don't quite know how to prescribe it. And you and your uh, speeches seem to articulate inherent unfairness. Now, obviously, their solutions would have been um, disastrous for mankind, um, but they could certainly tell there was a problem. Did this give you like a sense of hope and optimism that your speeches went viral? Was this a strange phenomena for you? Uh, well, uh... I didn't expect to go as far as it, it did. I mean, one of my speeches on all the channels hit over 30 million uh, views, 30 million. I mean, quite extraordinary. And some of them are being regurgitated now because what I said then is just as true now. And one of my speeches, which was tax, the life of the Englishman, tax in the life of the Englishman, um, uh, that I gather from somebody, uh, somebody told me just the other day, has regurgitated, got another 4 million views in the last month, another 4 million. Because what I'm actually saying then, uh, it was as true then as it is now. And of course, what I don't really accept, and I haven't accepted for some time, uh, you know, left and right. I think left and right is passe. I just don't think there is left and right. I think it's a very old phenomenon, left and right. Um, I think you have basically statist, uh, libertarian, uh, conservative with a small c. The term liberal has been completely deconstructed uh, by uh, Americans, you know, Americanese, if you will. Uh, I would, and you would, I suspect, regard liberal uh, as liberal uh, as in uh, William Gladstone, uh, classical liberalism. Uh, that's how, and probably one might argue, Lord Salisbury, of course, who was a conservative, but he was a liberal with a small l. Uh, and if you look at some of his speeches, they are very, very libertarian. So left and right, yes, I do get a lot of support from the left because I'm, I'm, what I'm doing is exposing the criminality of politicians, bureaucrats, and bankers who are working against uh, the ordinary Joe, the man on the Clapham omnibus. I'm very popular with old school uh, Labour, old Labour. Most of my votes in Yorkshire came from old Labour. I had branch chairmen who were old Labour. Because putting uh, uh, all the minutiae aside, um, they were actually sometimes misguidedly, in my view, but they were actually trying to do something for the working man. Nobody's trying to do anything for the working man now. If you are, uh, the artisan class, if you will, for want of a better expression. If you are a sparky, a chippy, a bricky, uh, or, or a cabbie, whatever it happens to, happens to be, um, you, you, you're politically homeless. There's nobody for you to vote for because everybody now is English middle class. And no good comes of it, as I said, because they're extremely stupid. Some of my stupid friends, or I have to say post-breakfast ex-friends, are Oxford. I am I'm convinced that if you went to Oxford, you can't get in unless you've had a lobotomy. Most people, from, they've never had an original thought in their head. I don't think I've ever met, with one or two fair exceptions, anybody who graduated from Oxford who had an original thought. Uh, and so consequently, they all think on rails. They're all Keynesians. Uh, they are all statists. They are all socialists with a small s. Uh, and these people, of course, they run the mainstream media. Uh, they run uh, all the political parties. Some are just rather more stupid than others. But now they're all stupid. I can't think of anybody in politics today um, who isn't fundamentally stupid. <laughs> well, I think that's, uh, yeah, I certainly share your sentiments there. In fact, the last time I voted for something was the vote in the referendum. Uh, I'm just, I was just thinking back to it, actually, and just remembering the build up to the referendum of uh, all the threats that were supposed to come from Brexit, you know, from, we heard from Obama at the time, we heard from big banks, we heard from big businesses, all threatening the British people away from um, you know, voting to uh, voting to leave. Uh, I, I really do think that looking back, that was a watershed moment, not just in British history, but really in world history. I do think it was the first great awakening, the first great rejection uh, of the political establishment, essentially. Um, since Brexit, uh, since 2016, do you think 
well, I can imagine your answer to this. Do you think Brexit has been a success? Uh, and if not, why not? Well, because we haven't really got Brexit, to be brutally frank. What we've done, we've taken away our commissioners and we've taken away our MEPs. We've changed virtually nothing else. We've rescinded almost no EU regulations or laws. The bureaucracy is still horrified that we left and I'm just pretending we didn't leave. Your civil, all the civil service are just pretending we didn't leave uh, and hope that one day they'll woke up and it'll all get better. Uh, Parliament didn't want it. Both houses, the Lords and the Commons, didn't want Brexit. It was negotiated by people who didn't want Brexit. Uh, Theresa May voted Remain and was a staunch Remainer. Boris, of course, is a political chancer and decided his avenue to number 10 Downing Street uh, was to turn himself into a fake Brexiteer. Uh, so well, he was a fake. He, he, was, a, he was a fake. Uh, so um, this is the problem. And in, incidentally, somebody, and I didn't get it, actually, at the time when they said it, it was in, uh, a, when I left uh, in, the Parliament in 2014, uh, somebody said to me, he was on the other side. I think he was a Tory Remainer or something. Can't remember. Uh, and he said, you see, what you've got to understand is uh, leaving, leaving the European Union won't make any difference because the new world order uh, is coming from the globalists. All the laws and legislation that we get don't come now from Brussels. They come from the World Economic Forum, the BIS, um, uh, the, the IMF. And of course, I sort of pondered it and I, I just thought perhaps it was sour grapes. But of course, now I know that he was right. Leaving the European Union hasn't made any difference whatsoever. Uh, we're still not governed uh, by a parliamentary democracy and a constitutional monarchy. And worse, worse, the prime minister, the leader of opposition, our World Economic Forum stooges, the chancellor is, the Archbishop of Canterbury, and horrifically, our king is a World Economic Forum stooge. And I speak as a monarchist. I've been a monarchist all my life. And here we have a king with no sense of shame at all. The most appalling man uh, who is quite upfront about standing on WAF program and the, print, the new Prince of Wales is the same. So it's very difficult to get away from being ruled by somebody from across the water somewhere. It's, it's a great shame. Absolutely, yes. I think... Um... Uh, yeah, any idea of self-governance, uh, which was the primary reason that the British people voted for Brexit in the first place. All the polling and data indicated that immigration was only a secondary policy, um, has very much not been fulfilled then. Uh, like you say, we may have left the European Union uh, in theory, uh, but in practice, we're still very much adherent to the laws uh, and like you say even if it's not the European Union it's either the WA, WEF the WHO let's turn to Covid actually whilst we're on this then I would I believe Covid to be the kind of second great awakening after uh, Brexit then however it's apparently making a comeback if I do just read from the independent here experts have warned it is quote reasonably certain that the UK is in another wave of COVID-19 and suggested people should wear face masks again uh, will you be wearing one Mr Bloom never did <laughs> never will uh, what might uh, be interesting for you to know is I finished my career in the city actually as the chief executive of a life assurance company. So I was and am fully cognizant of mortality statistics, health statistics, so on and so forth. And my website on this particular subject is the biggest in Britain because I get information from all over the world. And I was the first in. So I started it three or four years ago to explain to everybody and I haven't had to change my mind on anything. Now, if you look at the number of people who died um, uh, with COVID on their death certificate, you get a certain number. Uh, and if you just take those with a death certificate, which is all you can do when you're looking at mortality statistics as a professional or as an actuary, who actually died of COVID? Not pancreatic cancer and COVID, or heart failure and COVID, or a brain tumour and COVID, 
who actually died from COVID and nothing else? The answer is very, very few people indeed. And those that did, uh, they had uh, comorbidity, they're already weakened. And most, of course, were above, ironically, most above um, the age of their life expectancy. So it was mainly over 80s. Uh, so the whole concept was fake. Uh, and we and we now uh, can't, because everybody bought in, mainstream media bought in, uh, everybody bought into it, the bureaucracy bought into this for one reason or another, some with very sinister reasons, they can't now say, gosh, we've made a mistake. And of course, if you look at those clips from Chris Whitty and others talking about face masks, which you wrote, everybody knows that face masks the virus. They might stop a globule of paint if you're spraying the car, but they don't no good for anything else. My wife is a medic and she did her dissertation in, I think it was 1984, on the dangers of face masks. You actually inhale back uh, all the bugs and nonsense that is caught by it. You then inhale them. God made your body to expel that, to get rid of that. If you put a mask around your face, you're just breathing it back in. And of course, the latest, not that we need any more, the latest in-depth study comes from Germany, who does it, so they're not even neutral, they're positively dangerous. But of course, we all know that the reason they changed their mind on masks was to create a sinister fear, to make people afraid, to control people. And that's what masks are all about. And they want to get back to masks with a new mutated strain of COVID or whatever they invent next in order to regurgitate the fear. And I think perhaps the reason that they're doing that is because the world's going to boil one day uh, uh, because of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere isn't getting any traction. Nobody really believes it, unless, of course, you're English middle class who believe anything. So it's not getting any traction. So we've got to frighten people back into their cities, back into lockdown, 50 minute cities and all this. Kind. We've got to frighten them again. Let's revisit COVID. Whether it's going to work this time again, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah, so I think that's definitely something in that. I mean, I, uh, I read a report from the House of Lords from October 2022 uh, that stated that they're going to uh, look to see what they can learn from COVID, uh, particularly in response to the government changing people's behaviour and see what can then be applied to uh, changing people's behaviour in order to combat climate change. Well, let take that takes us probably nicely into uh, the ULES zone. I went up to London yesterday to go and watch a football match. Um, I didn't realise that I'd actually driven into the newly extended uh, ULES zone. Um, this... Uh, for anyone who doesn't know, now means that uh, unless your car meets the uh, regulations and criteria, uh, you cannot drive into the ULES zone uh, unless you want to pay a £12.50. Uh, I call it a fine. Yeah, let's call it a fine. Let's call it what it is. It's a tax. It's a tax on uh, being unenvironmentally friendly, which, of course, will disproportionately affect the poorest in society who can't afford to get an electric car, who can't afford to get a new muffler on their car or whatever it might be. Um, although some good news that I'd quite like to get your take on then, uh, this Blade Runner group have supposedly destroyed nine out of ten of these new uh, ULES uh, cameras in London. Uh, do you think people will stand for this ULES? Uh, how do you think people will respond to it? I would be delighted. We live in a world now, and I think it's a great shame, because broadly speaking, Britain is a law-abiding society. Uh, we are a law-abiding nation because we've had a system of law which has been very good. We've had common law and statute law. So law, uh, the definition of law, if you will, when I did principles of English law in my professional exams, comes really from the 1930s. And that is uh, the law should be what is deemed to be fair by the man on the clap of omnibus. It's got to be seen to be deemed to be fair. And when we subsumed our law of common law and statute law to corpus juris on the Napoleonic Code in the European Union, things were palpably not fair. Uh, and I believe it is the duty, because I believe these things to be illegal under the uh, Bill of Rights and the Toleration Acts, and our constitution, 
I believe that these cameras are illegal under natural law, which is basically comes not from Magna Carta, it comes from Anglo-Saxon times. We've got to go back to the Anglo-Saxons to find out our law and how our law works. It is the duty of London, Londoners to dismantle them, not, take, not steal them or take them away, to dismantle them or cover them uh, with, uh, you know, a hood like you might a bird of prey. Uh, and that is what you have to do. Because if you don't fight back with these people, if you don't push back against a tiny minority of people who want to dominate us in this way, freedom is something you have to fight for in some format. Uh, and if you want to be roll, if you want to roll over and take it day after day, um, but the people, these Blade Runner people, you know, they will be of the artisan class. They'll be working men. They won't be the English middle class. Because frankly, the English middle class bend over, drop their trousers and take it every single time because they've been lobotomized. They've got no morale. They've had their backbone taken out. But the artisan, your good, honest London Brit, uh, is doing something about it. Good for them. And incidentally, I don't know if there's any truth in it. I just heard that one or two senior politicians are now backing them as well, which is interesting. Yes. I, I mean, I, I wonder if people are jumping on the populist energy. Um, there's just, certainly does seem to be a lot of resentment uh, regarding these uh, these new cameras. Uh, and I can imagine that, uh, yeah, one or two people are going to... Um, I think Sadiq Khan is going to have a lot coming for him in the next uh, mayoral elections next year. Uh, well, obviously, people can revolt all they like. But if their money is also controlled by the government, which I suppose it is to some extent now, but if it's totally controlled by the government, like it would be were we to introduce a central bank digital currency. If I may read from you a little bit from John Cunliffe, the deputy governor of the Bank of England. Uh, he said in a speech last year that uh, we are now in the technical development stage of CBDCs, um, just to re-emphasize, well, maybe you could explain for everyone, Mr. Bloom, uh, what this actually means then, what a central bank digital currency will mean. Well, the goal, of course, and you have to understand what it is that they want, we already have a digital currency. We all have an electronic currency now. If you go into the bank, uh, let's say you want to borrow £20,000 to buy a car, they will create that, the bank clerk will create it if he considers you a good risk and a good customer and he'll tap it that 20,000 pound, he'll transfer it into your account. It doesn't really exist, uh, it, he's just invented it. And of course your central bank is your lender of last resort. So if, you're, uh, if your bank goes down uh, like Northern Rock or Lloyds or NatWest or whatever, which they did in 2007, the Bank of England steps in and prints more electronic money. What they want to do, and what this is something, and it's not a conspiracy theory. I get very, very annoyed when people say it's a conspiracy theory. Mm -hmm. If you check the IMF, the World Economic Forum, the UN, and the Bank of International Settlements, if you look at all their websites, their goal is quite up front. They want a cash-free society. Uh, and so... That means that they can control the population. So, for example, if they say we, you can't travel more than once a year on holiday because of your carbon footprint, uh, if you can't, uh, you can't do that. So when you go to your travel agent and you want to buy a second holiday wherever you go, it, the card will be rejected because you've had your holiday. Uh, if you've bought too much meat so far this year, it will go back to the situation that we had in the Second World War, rations. They'll say, no, I'm sorry, you've had your ration of meat so far because of the carbon footprint of farting animals. I mean, you couldn't really invent any of this, could you? But this is the question. Uh, you've travelled too much. You can't buy uh, any more petrol. You've bought your year's ration of petrol, uh, so you can't buy any more. And that's the kind of control that they're looking for. Uh, and, of course, going right up when the Prince of Wales, he's the king now, but when he was the Prince of Wales, he outlined this idea uh, loud and clear on the platform of the World Economic Forum. Uh, so this, we know this is what they want uh, and what they're trying to do. But in order to do that, you have to get rid of cash. Uh, and, of course, you see the gullible who don't understand how these things work. They go in and they buy a bottle of beer or a pound of butter uh, or, or a packet of cornflakes and at the co-op or Tesco, they lean across and they go ping with their phone. What they don't realize is 
they're playing into these people's hands. Uh, what actually that will mean when they do that kind of thing, that the big business will turn around and say, look, 99% of our transactions are electronic anyway. What's everybody worried about not having cash? It means that you can't make any transaction at all, either you or your family or your business. You can't do any of that without the government knowing. And there's an interesting thing, of course, what has the Bank of England said? The Bank of England said, don't worry, it won't be programmable. The whole point of it is programmable. That is the point of it, that they can tell you what to do and how to run your money. But of course, it's a bit like the Schleswig-Holstein question. There's only me and about a few other people who really understand what's going on when it comes to banking and money, because most people don't know what money is. They think paper money, a £20 note is money. It's not. It's fiat currency. And JP Morgan said in, 2000 and, uh, in uh, 1912, only gold is money. Everything else is credit. Everything else is a pr promissory note. Everything else is, uh, has counterparty risk. Now, here's the good news, possibly the good news, as they're working towards this. It is not in the interests of the commercial banks, because you have to lose the commercial banks in order to make this work, or certainly curtail it. So there's going to be an enormous pushback from big business as soon as this starts to happen. When big business, and don't forget big business is run generally speaking by uh, in this country, the English middle class. And I've just said how stupid they all are. One day they'll go bloody hell, we've all talked ourselves out of a job. There's no job for us. Uh, and this will also happen in America, of course, uh, where commercial banks are very big supporters for presidential campaigns. So you will find that there's a pushback against this. And we also know that they will try and make it programmable. And how do we know that? We know that because the Bank of England governor and the Deputy Bank of England governor have said they won't make it programmable. And you and I know that as soon as something is de denied by big business banking or politicians or bureaucrats, you know the opposite will be true. <laughs> Yes, I think that's definitely true. I mean, in that very speech that I just quoted from, uh, he used the words, and I quote, safe and effective at least six times uh, in relation to CBDCs. Now, where have we heard that phrase, safe and effective, again? Um, yes, I think anything that these people tell you about uh, how that they're not going to misuse it, uh, yeah, I definitely think I won't be listening to that. Uh, last question then, Mr. Bloom, as I know you're pushed for time. Uh, are you white-pilled or black-pilled for Britain's future? Uh, by that, I mean, are you optimistic or are you pessimistic? Given what we've just spoken about, it seems there's every reason to be pessimistic about it. Uh, what's your take on it? Well, I'm usually optimistic about most things. And I've always been optimistic if, as an historian. If you look back and you find uh, where we were in the Middle Ages, where we were in the English, one of the English civil wars, uh, go back further, the War of the Roses, so on and so forth. You can go through our history, and we've had our ups and our downs. And I always think the British people will come through. So generally speaking, I would be optimistic. However, there's another dynamic which is concerning me, is that our institutions and cultures are being degraded at such a fast pace. There aren't going to be enough indigenous Brits to actually bounce back as we always have as an island race. We have whole slabs of the country which are no-go areas from uh, illegal aliens, on some cases legal aliens, who don't buy into our culture. We're no longer a Christian society, and I don't mean God bothering and going to church. I'm talking about a fundamentally Christian society. If you want to trim that down, call it do as you would be done by. Um, and if you look at Sweden, which is now the rape capital uh, of the Northern Hemisphere, uh, and various other countries which have opened their doors to unlimited immigration, uh, we have a problem. And for the first time, and I still work, I'm still working, I still go to the city occasionally, I am meeting young, young friends, young colleagues uh, who are leaving the country. They are leaving the country uh, and taking up residential status in places like Cyprus and Portugal, where the tax regime is completely different. Young professionals 
uh, you know, could be uh, relatives of mine, uh, well paid, uh, working in the city, married to another girl who's also well paid, and they are now saying the tax we are paying is just we're giving up more than half of what we earn, and we and we work quite hard. We're up early and we work late in order to get this money, and it, but the government's just taking too much of it, uh, and so they're going. We had this in the 1970s when I was whatever, 25 years old, and people of my age in the mid 1970s were beginning to think about going. Um, so if your professional classes are going and you're from aliens coming in from quite subculture. Now, I don't have any problem with immigration uh, from uh, Europe, Eastern Europe. I, I never had a problem with that. But if they've come here to work, that, that doesn't give me a problem. They've come here to work. They buy into our society like the uh, immigrants did in North America of yesteryear. You know, they come, they buy into the idea of America. They buy into the idea of freedom. They buy into this. I married into a Polish family. My father-in-law was a very, was very Anglophile, worked very hard and was a very successful businessman. The people pouring, pouring into Dover, pouring into Dover are not that ill. They're not that ill. These people are not tomorrow's entrepreneurs and tomorrow's doctors and tomorrow's businessmen. I mean, the fact that we have to have signs in London telling people not to defecate on the platform tells you the sort of people now that we're getting in. I've no problem with uh, a Polish or Czech mechanic coming in or computer pro. I don't have a problem with any of that at all. I don't have a problem with color. I don't care who comes into the country. As long as they're welcome, they've come to work. And that is the problem. And it's been the problem now for some decades. What we don't do is we don't distinguish between good immigration and bad immigration. And until we start to do that, we're not going to move further forward. And of course, the opposition, the Labour Party are even worse than this lot. This lot are bad enough. <laughs> yes, I dread to think what the next Labour government will be like after 13 years of Conservative government. Yeah, I think you're certainly correct there. And um, there's plenty to be pessimistic about them when our culture seems uh, degraded as it uh, as it seems to be increasingly as the day goes on uh, when our political institutions uh, are so openly corrupted when institutions like big tech and social media uh, are wantingly engaging in activities of uh, uh, sensory you know censorship and whatnot it does um, lead one to be ultimately pessimistic however what gives me optimistic uh, what gives me uh, optimism and hope, Mr. Bloom, are people like yourself, are, you know, thousands of, you know, small podcasters and YouTubers out there who are trying to cover these issues and trying to get the uh, the truth out to the British people as best as possible and indeed to the world. So thank you very much for this interview. Um, please keep up the good work. And can you let people know where they can find your material? Uh, yes, my website is the best place to go. Uh, it carries all my articles, speeches, absolutely everything, and others now uh, of, of very good sort of people uh, who I've interviewed uh, and shared things with. Uh, it's simple. It's godfreybloom.uk. God, small case, godfreybloom.uk. And one tip, if I may, to your subscribers, uh, Ross, is that if you want to know what to do, you know, you wake up, you listen to this, our chat and you wake up in the morning saying, yeah, but it's over. Well, what can I do? I'll, let me just give you something that's going to make you feel better. Make everybody feel better. Don't pay the BBC. Cancel your banker's order and don't pay them because yeah. they're the root of the trouble. And as soon as we can put them out of business, the better. And it'll make you feel better. And it will save you some money as well. I just did it myself a couple Always of months good. ago. Always good. <laughs> Absolutely. Absolutely excellent. <laughs> Um, Godfrey Boom, thank you very much. Uh, this has been UK Liber TV. Uh, catch you next time. Peace. Uh, as most of you know, my work is very heavily independently research based, uh, and I get my information from all over the world. It would help if you press the subscribe button and the little bell next to it, because the more subscribers I have, uh, the more likely it is that international uh, independent research institutes will share their material with me. It's most helpful, and then, of course, I'll automatically share it with you. Uh, so, surprise, won't cost you anything. Uh, thank you very much.